Welcome to the Audit Informer, a platform for expert knowledge sharing and examining trends in the profession. In this interview, Dr. Negrini discusses how to identify the seven patterns in numbers that can be used to detect fraud. He also talks about his paper, The Patterns of the Numbers Used in Occupational Fraud Schemes, recently published in the Managerial Auditing Journal. So we're here in Ottawa with Dr. Mark Negrini, and uh, we're here to talk about patterns in numbers, specifically to detect fraud. And I understand that you've written a paper about it, so you wanted to talk more about that and delve a little deeper. So what are the seven patterns, Mark? On, oh, uh, so actually, we, we, we do have to start with what types of fraud we care about. Okay. <clears throat> so we care about good old embezzlement, and this is theft by deception and generally theft of, of something that has been entrusted to you. We also care about good old bribery. And in this college admission scandal, bribery has been, it's not a daily thing on the newspaper, but it's close to that. And then we care about financial statement fraud, which is where you issue deceptive financial statements in order to deceive investors or shareholders or, or lenders or something like that. So those are the three things we care about. And what I found, was that the fraudsters generally like to use round numbers. This is one of their favorites, so numbers such as 5,000 or 8,000 or 16,000. They enjoy that. They also enjoy to use numbers that are rising at a rather rapid clip mm -hmm. because they are just getting greedier and greedier as time goes by. They also like to have their numbers just be below some threshold, and this is usually the threshold at which they think they will be caught. Basically, if we look out of our window here, we see people driving, and they are driving at a speed just below what they think they can get away with without being right. caught. Right. Right. They also like to sometimes round numbers strategically. So this could be something like unemployment statistics, where the government would like the number to be lower, and if they can round down, they would always try to round down because that makes governments uh, look better as such. They also try to use numbers that, that don't follow Benford's law, sort of anti-Benford type numbers. Those come up in the fraud schemes. A favor of mine is repeated numbers. And this would be where the accountant purposely overpays an amount. And the idea being that the refund that comes back is going to be diverted for his or her own use. And lastly, believe it or not, they like to use numbers that are outliers, and these are numbers that are outrageously big. And you would think that they would not use it, but I'm happy to say if they do. They're not very clever, are they? They're, They're not very clever. <laughs> no. I, I would not call them the, the, the sharpest tool in the, in the toolbox. Right, uh, right. Yes. With okay. hindsight, they're always not the sharpest tool. So are there only seven, or are there more that have yet to be discovered? So there might be newer patterns, but at least in, in all the cases that I've looked at, and I try to group them, and, and this, this research started in 2014. I don't know if you can remember, that was how many iPhones ago? <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, in 2014, and I've basically just added to it and made it better and better and better. Now it's 2019, so finally after five years, it got published in a journal. And, and this is the result of looking at lots of different cases. When I say lots, 50 or something like that, mm -hmm. there might be other patterns out there who knows, I'll right? find them. Yes, you'll find them. <laughs> I'll find them if they're there. <laughs> and have you found in your research that there are ones that are used more often than not? Or is there sort of a hierarchy um, of ones that are more indicative of fraud or not? So, is there a hierarchy? That is, that is pretty hard, except mm. that that second category that I mentioned, the numbers that are rapidly rising. Right. You know, they don't know when to stop. They have the scheme, it's working, and now I'm either using my P card to to run my side business, or I figured out how to do it, and they don't know when to stop. And yes. I had, we can talk about this at the end, but Nathan Mueller, um, one thing from his own writing, he said, I joke when I stole 1 million in 2004, 2 million in 2005, 4 million in 2006. Right. Why don't we talk about that since you we brought it up? We can talk about yeah. So what, what was his sort of response? What was motivating him to continue to do it, even though he probably knew inside that this is probably not the right thing to do? Well, Nathan knew that he would, he would eventually get caught. And, and I actually collaborated with Nathan, and Nathan yes. and I wrote an article together while Nathan was in federal prison in Duluth, Minnesota. Amazing. So Nathan was in prison, 
And Nathan, the part that Nathan wrote was how I did my fraud, because that part Nathan knew. Yes. <laughs> then the part that I wrote was how we could have prevented and detected the fraud that Nathan actually did. And then we sort of wrapped it up with a bit of an introduction and things at the end. Right. And that article actually won the prize for the best article in 2014 for the Journal of Accountancy. Excellent. I'm pleased to say. Yes. And you so, presented with him as well at so conferences. So I, I collaborated with Nathan. Yep. And then at the ACFE Global Conference in 2015, Nathan, Nathan was the conference closer. Mm -hmm. So he was the end of the conference, here it is, Nathan Mueller, somebody that you would want to catch. Right. And so I was allowed to introduce him and I had, uh, I had two sessions where I spoke about Nathan's fraud. I was sort of like the opening act, you know, for the musicians. Mm -hmm. I, I, was Nathan's, I was Nathan's opening act. Great, great. Okay. Um, so, and he was smooth. Yeah. Good looking, was, <laughs> smooth, likable. Aren't they all, aren't they oh all my right? Goodness. They are yeah. all good looking and smooth and nice and highly liked. I, 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 I one fraud to Ryan. I said, Ryan, did they like you at work? He said, they even still like me now. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's pushing his luck there a bit. Yeah. But that's what they feel. They are liked at work. Right, right. And that's, that's how they how get you, the that's trust. That's how you get away with yes. it. Yes. Yep. And of course, of fraud, fraud is an abusing a position of trust. Mm -hmm. So you need to be put in the position of trust in order to abuse it, which is why people, when people say, oh, is there an age limit or something like this? There is actually, oh, because 24-year-olds okay. are not put in a high position of trust uh, as being controller of a group of companies. You actually get that trust when you're older. So which is why the statistics will show it's older people that get caught for fraud because they can do it. Okay. Great. Um, so going back to these patterns then and the different types of fraud schemes, are there certain types of fraud schemes where you see the patterns more? So are they associated? Can you kind of map them to these types of fraud schemes? You see these patterns, these types, you see this other pattern. So of course, we're talking about people and we're talking about people that see a gap mm -hmm. in, in internal control and they are now exploiting this gap and they do so in different ways. Probably the most the most regular thing that I see is when it comes to bribery. Yes. Bribes are round numbers. Okay. I, for all the cases I look at, it's round numbers. Except one case, I saw Rolls Royce gave a Rolls Royce to a customer. So when you give a Rolls Royce to a customer, then it's not a round number. Yeah, it's a, a car, flag. and yep. you have to value the car at four hundred and sixty thousand dollars or something like that. Okay. But other than the Rolls Royce, these are round numbers. Okay. And in terms of relying on these patterns to develop uh, like analytics tests and whatnot, are there any sort of pitfalls that we should keep in mind? Um, for example, in your paper, you talked a lot about false positives being an issue in, in many of them. So are there any things like that that we can reduce the number of false positives? So quite to right. So with round numbers, there are plenty of valid transactions that are round numbers as well. Yes. So with round numbers, we are going to get lots of false positives and it is going to be a case of slicing and dicing mm -hmm. okay so the fraud could probably not be something that was booked to an inventory account it might not be this and then you have to slowly whittle it down but auditors need to realize that this is an iterative process right it's not just press one button and then as uh, jeff said earlier yes. press rerun yeah. once and you immediately get and your answer and you don't need to do anything else right <laughs> you, you yeah. can go out and have yeah. lunch and you've caught the fraudster okay. um, no iterative process and over and over again Sometimes they popped very fast. So for example, I was looking at one big airline and we were looking for frequent flyer fraud. Mm -hmm. And this was where employees had figured out how to attach miles to their own personal frequent flyer account. And all we did was we ran a test saying who got the most miles last year. Okay. And there at the top of the list, a whole page of people, 800,000 miles, wow. 900,000 miles, you can't get 900,000 miles if you fly every day. <laughs> but they got it because they were cheating the system and they knew how to game the system. So in that case, we just looked at the largest miles getters. Mm -hmm. They were at the top of the page, end of story. So easy, easy to find. So when, easy to find yeah. in that case. Yes. In other cases, harder. Okay, right. Um, so going along those lines, uh, so with respect to threshold numbers now. Yes. So I know you talked a little bit about Benf Benford's Law already. And yes. um, how can Benford's Law be used to detect structuring in things like 
avoiding reporting requirements for AML legislation. So we had a very nice fraud case where the controller was in charge of three nightclubs and she stole $2.5 million in cash from these nightclubs over a period of two years before she got caught. The way she was caught was, I'm not exactly sure how she was caught, but what the FBI proved in the court documents mm -hmm. was that she was depositing amounts of 9,900 into her bank account regularly, and this is called structuring. Right. And so the way Benford would work, uh, would pick this up, is these $9,900 deposits all have first two digits of double nine. And double nine is the least likely first two digit combination. So if your account has got lots of deposits of double nine, and double nine is the least likely first two digit combination, mm -hmm. It'll you stand out might just sure. be structuring. Okay, right. Um, so if someone understands how Benford's law works, yes. yeah, is it possible to falsify numbers to be able to conform so, so as not to go detected? So people might say, okay, you know how Benford's law works and you know about Benford, let me do a fraud that is very Benford. And I have a few things to say to that. Benford's law is quite complicated. We have expected proportions, we have actual proportions, we have a graph, we have mean absolute deviations. It's quite complicated. Right. Our average fraudster, not so no, clever. as we said <laughs> Not earlier. so clever. Yeah. Number two, when they're doing their fraud, and let's say they're doing their fraud in December of 2019, they don't know what 2019's data looks like because 2019 isn't finished yet. Today is the 16th, I don't know, 17th of December. I'm doing my fraud. I don't know what December's data looks like, so I might actually pick something that uh, will spike on a Benford's Law graph. And number three, if Benford's Law is the only test that the auditor runs, I, I click, oh, it looks nice, end of audit. Mm, no. no, Benford's Law should be my starting point right. for greater things to come. Okay. And what I saw in the idea demonstrations that I saw earlier today, Benford's Law gets mixed in with a whole lot of other tests, right. the outliers and this and that, and that is the way it should work. It's, sure. It, it's part of the... Package. The toolbox, right? Part of the toolbox. Right. It's not the whole toolbox. Right. Toolbox. So the auditor still needs to look at it all and make some judgments based on that, based on the outputs of all of those tests. Because yeah. it is quite easy to have a fraud that just gets hidden in the mass. You can have 10 million transactions. A fraud might only use 12 transactions per month. These 12 will just get hidden in right. the in the whole bundle. So Benford law is a starting point. Okay, great. All right, and then outliers. Um, yes. So in a reporting setting, outliers tend to be bigger numbers. Are there other types of outliers that we and should? Actually, this is very important. There are other types of outliers yeah. and the AICPA, they actually talk about items that are material and what they say, it is not only big items that are material. Mm -hmm. For example, some item that changes a loss into a gain even though it might be a small number, mm. this is, uh, it, it has a material effect on the financial statements. Right. Or something that makes you meet a loan covenant uh, agreement stipulations as opposed to missing it. Even though the amount, the journal entry might be small that causes you to do it, that is material. Also something that might make you meet an analyst's forecast mm -hmm. as opposed to slightly missing it, yep. even though the amount is small, it should still be seen so as material. So it's the impact of it as well. It's seeing what, what impact that change has to determine if there's a, a red flag as well. You can be on my team. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then lastly, I just want to close with, um, so we have regulatory bodies. We have the SEC and we talked a little bit about AML. Are they using these sort of fraud patterns? Do they know about these fraud patterns in order to detect um, in their own testing, in their own examination. Yes, and I would love to say yes. Yes. However, the nice thing is this published was, this this published this published was paper <laughs> <laughs> in about May this year. Okay. And so everything is new, and and so I'm sort of on my quest now to to tell as many people as I can about right. it. And I am happy to say that I I have presented twice this year to two federal government bodies and at least getting them aware of these things like the thresholds and the mm -hmm. round numbers and the rising numbers. Right. It's a slow process. Right. Um, 
Okay. It's sad, but it's slow. <laughs> yes, as, as anything. But I, I imagine it, they're not super surprised when they hear about it. It's just you've put it in a way that can be sort of digested, right? Uh, Bringing it down to... I read the comments and the yeah. comments are, oh, I never thought of this or you packaged it nicely, packaged it and, nicely. You, and you showed me that, that these patterns actually exist. Yes. Because we sort of, we intuitively think that there must be a pattern of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, and this was just putting it together with, with real court cases and real cases. Right. And nothing's more exciting than hearing about real fraud actual cases. Actual studies, and yes. Actual studies, yeah, even, yeah. At, even at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. That was great. <laughs>